Okay, thank you everyone for joining. Um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. It's about four after seven and uh, the folks have started to dwindle down as far as who's popping in. Um, got about 87 folks online right now. So really appreciate everyone's attendance tonight. This is uh, the Southwest District Fisheries Informational Meeting. My name is Tony Barretta. I'm an assistant division administrator with our fisheries division leading our fisheries management team. And we got a great program for you tonight um, with, with updates uh, from a statewide basis and a lot of details of, of work uh, and plans going on in the Southwest District. Okay. Um, really want to uh, acknowledge a few folks that are online right now. Our division administrator uh, for fisheries, Dean Rosenthal. Um, multiple commissioners, we really appreciate you being on. Uh, Commissioner Zingula, uh, Bergeron, Allen, and Hoggett. Uh, and then also uh, former Commissioner Burke. We really appreciate everyone's attendance on, on tonight's meeting. Um, one other thing that we have uh, um, is a lot of different staff members uh, from the Game and Parks Commission on tonight from uh, within the fisheries division, but also our parks, law enforcement, uh, wildlife division, a lot of our different divisions being represented tonight. So appreciate everyone being on. Should be able to field a lot of different types of questions tonight at the end of the session. Try to click ahead in my program here. Bear with us a little bit. It seems like our internet connectivity is a little bit uh, slow. I may ask everyone, uh, for those of you that do not have your, uh, your video off, to turn that off. Um, so we, we're, we're asking everybody to click on mute. Um, really slow here. Um, turn their video off to help, uh, help with bandwidth. And I'm not sure um, if my program is advancing right now. It seems like there's there's quite a bit of interference. Um, apologize for the technical difficulties right now. Okay, so uh, bear with us a, uh, a minute. I'm gonna. I'm gonna hop off. We may have to reshare this presentation because our internet connectivity is a little bit low. So uh, one minute, apologize for the Sorry, if, sorry for the technical difficulties here. Um, 
Um, I'm curious if everybody's able to see this and, and hear me a little bit better now with me sharing it from my screen. Okay, I'm getting a thumbs up from one of my colleagues. Um, so we're gonna go this route. Uh, and uh, once again, thanks everybody for, uh, for popping on here. We'll, we'll get going with the presentation here. So like I said, I uh, want everybody to click mute, turn their video off. Um, we're gonna be taking a lot of our, our questions in the chat box. Um, so as, as questions come up, use this chat box at the bottom of your screen to submit questions, comments, that sort of thing. I wanna talk about things that are new for uh, 2022. Um, Hope everybody has had the chance to uh, peruse and pick up uh, the new fishing guide for 2022. Um, from a standpoint from the Southwest District, uh, our black bass regulations did change, um, especially in the uh, in the area for uh, the NPPD Canal starting at Southern Sutherland Reservoir to the out, uh, outlet to the confluence of the South Platte River in Lincoln County, um, including Lake Maloney where we have uh, um, extended that no minimum blank limit on smallmouth bass in that area. Um, some other things that are uh, pertinent for the Southwest District as far as changes, uh, it is now illegal to possess uh, striped bass hybrids, so wipers, on Lonigan Creek and it's, uh, and it's from its junction at McConaughey upstream to the culvert near Highway 92. Um, and then uh, a few other uh, changes that deal with our paddle fish, no live bait fish, but um, are in uh, other areas of the state. So want everybody to be aware of new changes. Um, it's always a good idea to pick up the fishing guide and be aware of just regulations in general as you go out fishing. Something we wanted to bring up uh, for that we wanna really uh, tout this year is our aquatic habitat program. Back in 1997, we started collecting a $5 fee with our, with our license sales um, to really help enhance our aquatic habitat in a lot of our aging and uh, reservoirs and water bodies that were uh, really struggling for water quality and aquatic habitat. Um, this year, 2022, marks the 25-year anniversary of that program, and we're celebrating that in a number of different ways. Um, one, of those, one of those ways is going to be a, a marquee event at Conestoga State Rec Area, where we will be having a, a big event on June 18th, where we're going to promote a lot of the things the Aquatic Habitat Program has done, and we're going to promote Nebraska fishing in general. Um, this program has been very impactful over uh, these 25 years, spanning the entire state, uh, the geographic range of the entire state, and uh, we've done over 130 projects throughout this time, impacting many anglers and providing better water quality, habitat, and angler access. Uh, some other things that are going on currently uh, around the state are our trout stockings. We're stocking catchable size rainbow trout currently. Um, we, our, our trucks were out and about uh, starting, starting this week and, and uh, stocking them all over the state. Rainbow trout, these rainbow trout stockings are, are very beneficial to uh, different fisheries for people to really get, get, folks out, uh, get folks out fishing in this early part of spring. Uh, it's a great opportunity to take children and, and people that are new to fishing because it is, you can catch these fish readily. That There's usually high catch rates. Um, you can use simple techniques for them and it, it, it can provide a really positive atmosphere um, when, when, you are, when you are fishing. Um, speaking of taking people fishing, we are, uh, we are going to do a Take Them Fishing Nebraska campaign again this year. This has been a great uh, program that we've run, run the last couple years where we really want individuals that, uh, you know, 
are are in tune with fishing, are 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 veterans of fishing to take kids, take uh, new people out fishing, and even take people that maybe haven't fished in a long time back out fishing, re reintroduce them to the sport. Um, this Take Them Fishing campaign runs from April 15th uh, through the fall period, and uh, you can enter in to win a lot of different types of prizes um, by, by uploading your photos and, and uh, sharing your story about who you took fishing. Um, different packages include state park uh, fishing getaways where a lot of different uh, high quality fishing gear is included with uh, some complimentary stays at a number of our state parks. One other thing that's currently happening uh, right now and that we're going to be doing quite a bit more of here in the next uh, few weeks to months is uh, collecting brood fish and, and trying to get fish into our hatchery system so we can raise them and then eventually uh, be stocked into our different water bodies across the state. And to highlight some of these types of activities, we're going to play a couple of videos for you, a kind of a kind of a behind the scenes look at what goes on with some of our broodstock collections. So hopefully this video will play. that none of it okay So I uh, apologize for the quality again, uh, was told by one of my colleagues that the video wasn't working very well. And, and uh, so um, probably going to skip this next one too. So um, once again, going off the cuff here, uh, having, having some issues. We, we did this program last night and, and everything went off without a hitch. So anyway, um, at this point, I am going to... Uh, turn it over to our Southwest District Supervisor, Brad Eifert, who's going to be talking about some of the projects that are going on in the Southwest District. Um, and we actually haven't uh, practiced this, uh, this yet because it was, um, I was going to be controlling his screen instead of the opposite way. So I'm going to talk Brad through what, what he needs to do. Um, Brad, on, on top of your screen view, uh, on, on the top, you can click on that options and you should be able to request remote control from me. I'm not seeing that, Tony. Is my uh, screen still sharing or not? There, we got a map. Can you see anything at the top, Brad, that now, since I'm sharing my screen, okay, I can see it go. Now. I'm going to, I'm going to go to approve and hopefully, uh, <clears throat> hopefully this works where you can take over um, and start clicking through your slides. So if you click now, Brad, um, it says you're controlling the screen now.
pretty choppy out here, Tony. I don't, our bandwidth says we're real low, but we'll give it a go. Can you understand me and see me on the video right now? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, we'll give it a go then. Um, yeah, I apologize for all these technical difficulties here. Um, yeah, my name is Brad Eifert. I'm the current district supervisor for the Southwest Fisheries District out here in Kearney. Um, in Kearney here, we have uh, we have uh, two fisheries management staff that work out of our Kearney office, as well as a research biologist. And then we also have fisheries management staff that works out of our North Platte office and also out at Lake McConaughey and at Ogallala. Um, in addition, we have hatchery staff that works at the North Platte Hatchery and also down at Parks at the Rock Creek facility. It's choppy, sorry. All right, we'll try this. The Southwest District uh, contains about, uh, contains 30 counties here in the Southwest part of the state. You know, we have a population of over 350,000 people that live in this part of the, part of the state of Nebraska, which is about 18% of Nebraska's complete population. Um, in our district, we have over 180 water bodies, um, totaling about 72,000 acres of water when everything's full. Um, this comprises over 60% of the public water in Nebraska. Um, we have, the, we have uh, Lake McConaughey, which is Nebraska's largest reservoir on the western edge of our district. And then we have uh, 11 other reservoirs in our system that are over a thousand acres in size. You know, in addition to that, we also have over 60 interstate lakes and uh, quite a few urban lakes and other smaller impoundments spread throughout the district. Another thing that's kind of unique about the Southwest district is we have a lot of miles of uh, canals that are fishable, large canals, such as the, the Sutherland Supply Canal, the Tri-County Canal, et cetera. And then we also have many miles of rivers also. Just to click every time twice. This is incredibly painful. All right, Tony mentioned that the Aquatic Habitat Project in Nebraska has been around for 25 years now. And that previous map, if we can get back to it. There we go. This map shows that we've done uh, projects in pretty much most of the counties in uh, Nebraska or in our district. Tony, this thing's just jumping around. It's just doing what it wants to do, Tony. It's going forward on its own. Okay. So, oh. Hey, sorry, Brad. Brad, I'll just try to do my best here. And, and we're having, it seems like the state net, network is having internet issues right now because it's on our end. I think it's on your end and, and everywhere. But I'll yeah, try to control. On our end here, so. I'll, I'll try to control the, uh, I'll, I'll click through the slides. You just tell me when to click because then there, there'll probably be less of a lag. So which uh, slide do you okay, want to yeah, do? Let's, let's just start with Crystal Lake here. Um, okay. 
Yeah, we've done it. We've done aquatic habitat projects over the last 25 years in most of our district and covered a lot of different water bodies. Uh, one that we just finished here this summer, past summer, was at Crystal Lake in Air, Nebraska, which is over in Adams County. This little pond was created back in the 1880s as, an, as a lake to, to harvest ice out of. And uh, so it was built shallow to start with, and it, you know, had fish kills and a lot of vegetation issues. So, you know, using aquatic habitat funds and then funding from the Department of Environmental Quality or Energy and Environmental Trust and the Little Blue NRD, you know, we were able to put together a good little project on this lake where we, we deepened the lake, uh, created some good fishing access, built some uh, fishing piers, and then added a, a restroom and some other improvements. So it was finished in uh, this summer and it's been restocked with bass, bluegill and crappie and catfish and it should provide a good fishery for years to come. All right, you can go ahead. Uh, Victoria Spring State Rec Area is, is our, our oldest state rec area in the state and it has a small pond on it that uh, was renovated back in 2013 using aquatic habitat funds. Um, you know, since that aquatic habitat project, the water in there is real clear now since we deepened it and removed all the rough fish. Um, but it's led to a new problem with a lot of aquatic vegetation and uh, duckweed growing in there, which has led to some fish kills over the years and also, you know, just some aesthetic issues that, that people don't like to see when they visit a lake. So. We've entered into a contract with an engineering firm to do some nutrient evaluation studies on this lake to determine what's causing the, the high levels of nitrogen and phosphorus that's contributing to this uh, duckweed and, and aquatic plant growth. So hopefully, you know, by this summer, we'll have the study complete and we can uh, have some recommendations in hand to move forward and try to figure out uh, how to make this little lake a better fishery. Okay. Uh, Harlan Reservoir is a, a second largest reservoir in our district and uh, you know it has uh, several large coves on it that uh, provide critical habitat for shoreline species such as crappie for for spawning areas and for rearing their their larval fish and uh, you know we've in the past we've spent some aquatic habitat dollars down there doing some projects on Gremlin Cove and Patterson Harbor down on the lower end of the reservoir but there's several other coves in the lake that you know, are very important, but they tend to lose their connectivity with the reservoir when water levels drop. Uh, shoreline erosion over the years has caused the mouths of a lot of these coves to silt in. And so you know, we're looking at ways to fund some, some additional aquatic habitat projects down there to try to open up some of these coves. You can go ahead. You know, unfortunately, it's really expensive to do these large scale projects. Um, and so funding is always a big issue. And so Game and Parks has worked with the Corps of Engineers, the local people down at Rep City, as well as um, the people in the Kansas City District to pursue some 1135 funding, um, which is federal funding that is uh, allocated to the Corps of Engineers to use on their properties to to do aquatic and environmental enhancements. And so we've been working with the Corps for a multitude of years now, trying to secure some of this 1135 money from the, from the federal government to help do a project down there. And through a process of elimination and some lots of studying, we, we've selected Methodist Cove as the probable location where we're gonna do this 1135 project. And uh, we've been waiting for some funding to be authorized through Cong Congress. And it sounds like that's getting more and more promising all the time. And so we're starting to move forward uh, in the process and sign some agreements. And hopefully, you know, we can start some preliminary engineering and design on this and get something rolling on, on the Methodist Cove in terms of aquatic habitat improvements in the next couple of years. So 
it should provide some nice shoreline fishing for people who visit the campground there at Methodist, as well as, you know, some excellent fish habitat in the future. And then the final project we've done in the district uh, this year is breakwater repair on one of the large breakwaters that protect the Trail 5 area at Sherman Reservoir. Um, back in you know, 2005, 6, and 7, we did a great big aquatic habitat project up at Sherman where we spent several million dollars protecting cove habitat in that lake. And, and it's been very successful, and, but we did have a little damage on this one we had to repair. So we used some aquatic habitat funding to repair that this summer. All right, go ahead, Tony. You know, angler access, we've kind of learned over the years that uh, it's, it's ext extremely important for anglers to have, you know, easy, convenient access to the, to the lake to uh, get out and fish, you know, especially for, you know, young families with, with beginning children out there learning how to fish or with people who, you know, have a little bit tougher time getting around. So we've, you know, in recent years, we've uh, developed an angler access program where we've dedicated funding to you know, improve angular access on many of our water bodies. Okay, you can go ahead. Uh, one project that just is getting started this, this last week or two is that the North Platte interchange, there's the North Platte Interstate 80 Lake that's part of the city of North Platte, Platte's park system at Iron Horse Park. Um, this project is going to enha enhance both angler and boat access by creating uh, five wooden fishing piers for anglers to fish off of a little more conveniently. We'll put some uh, shoreline or some vegetation mats underneath these to help uh, reduce vegetation growth to make angling easy easier. We've also got a boat ramp improvement project on the lake to improve that and add a courtesy dock as well as adding a kayak launching area on a portion of the lake. So this project is supposed to be done by Memorial Day weekend or early part of June. So it should be a nice project for the city of North Platte. You can go ahead. You know, interstate lakes uh, have been very popular for anglers over the years because they typically provide really good shoreline access for bank anglers who are, you know, want to want to fish these lakes to to catch bass, bluegill, crappie, etc. But over the years, we've seen uh, quite a bit of encroachment of brush and and trees and and invasive species such as you know Russian olives and cedar trees and cattails along these banks that make it really tough for anglers to fish them. So. We've got some money that we're gonna spend on several of these lakes over the next few years to go in and remove some of this brush and make the shorelines a lot more angler friendly for people. And in addition at COZAD WMA, which is an interstate lake just on the south side of COZAD, we plan on, we're in the preliminary stages of doing an angler access project there where we add a couple, we're gonna add a couple angler piers for people to fish off of, as well as create some better kayak access to the lake for people and then do some improvements to the boat ramp there also. So those will be coming up in the near future also. Go ahead, Tony. Uh, boating access projects, um, you know, considering most of our big, we have uh, a dozen or so large reservoirs in our district and all these reservoirs were constructed with the purpose of using the water in the summer for power generation and irrigation. So we see large fluctuations in all these reservoirs during the summer months. So it can be a real challenge to get boats on some of these water bodies um, and keep them and keep the ramps open on a summer, all summer basis. Um, right now we've got several major projects going on in the Southwest district where we're you know, we've got new ramps in, in the process of design as well as in construction. And uh, the next few slides will highlight some of those. Go ahead. Yeah, Lake McConaughey, it's probably one of the biggest challenges we have to get to keep boats get in there on a on a summer all summer basis. 
Um, you know, typically that reservoir will fluctuate about 14 feet in an average year. Um, some years it's more, some years it's less, but um, considering a lot of the shoreline is pretty gradual, when you get a 14 foot vertical drop in water levels, you know, that um, translates into a pretty long boat ramp that you have to build to, to keep people on concrete. So um, we have currently have projects going on at Martin Bay and, to, and Cedar View to improve boat ramps. Um, Martin Bay is the, probably the bigger of the two projects. We're putting in a, a new two lane steeper ramp that will hopefully accommodate larger boats. Um, Cedar View is going to get some additional parking and that type of thing, as well as, well as some better access to the boat ramp. And then uh, both of them are going to get new docks, courtesy docks, new restrooms, lighting. Uh, Martin Bay is going to get a, a new Barracuda fish cleaning station for anglers to use. And hopefully Cedar View will get a, a new fish cleaning station too. We're just waiting on some possible funding on that issue. So uh, this project's a several million dollar project. It's scheduled to be completed this, this summer. And it was funded by, you know, some parks funding, some sport fish funding, and then from the Federal Highway Transportation Fund also contributed quite a bit of money. So you can go to the next one. Uh, Ender's Reservoir, uh, one of the southwest reservoirs in the far southwest corner of the state. Uh, you know, Ender's has long suffered from from uh, low water levels and very difficult boat access. Currently, we don't have any concrete ramps available on the reservoir. Um, we have recently bid out, and I think the contract has possibly been awarded already for uh, construction to start this summer on two new boat ramps for that lake. We're going to put one on the northeast side of the lake and then also on the south side. Um, both will be concrete ramps. Um, we'll get new courtesy docks for that reservoir as well as lighting and, uh, and, and better parking. There'll be a breakwater that's put in on both of them to uh, help reduce wave activity and that type of thing. So that project should be going getting started sometime during the summer here and hopefully will be done you know, by late fall or the first part of summer of 2023. Okay, go ahead. The next boat ramp project is gonna take place at Phillips Canyon Reservoir. Um, if you're not familiar with where Phillips Canyon is, it's the lowermost reservoir on the Platte Valley system. It's just a couple of miles below Johnson Lake. Um, for years, this lake has had a has had terrible access to it for boaters. Um, you have to travel down a gravel and a dirt road to get to a minimal, minimally maintained gravel ramp. And, you know, it's been a big issue over the years. So we've partnership with Central Nebraska Public Power and Irrigation District uh, to create a, an entire new ramp location on this reservoir. We uh, you know, currently have picked a spot on the north side of the reservoir, which will, will be coming off of Highway 183. There'll be a short just stretch of gravel road to get to this area, and it'll be a lot more convenient for boaters to get to. We've got uh, the project has currently been designed already, and it calls for a new concrete boat ramp, new dock, and improved access road and lighting and a restroom. Uh, with our partnership with Central, we've uh, Central has volunteered their equipment and time to do a lot of the dirt work for the project and improve the access road. And then Game and Parks will cover the cost of the actual boat ramp construction and the other, the lights and the bathroom and that type of thing. So we're hoping this can go out to bid this summer and hopefully be complete completed by the fall of 2022. So, all right, you can go ahead. Uh, finally, Harlan Reservoir. If any of you are familiar with Harlan Reservoir, you'll know that boating access on the south side of the reservoir can be pretty difficult at times. Uh, currently, the only public access on the south side during high water periods is at Patterson Harbor. And the boat ramp there is, is typically you know, pretty congested down there. There's very limited parking. And so uh, We've kind of partnered up with the Corps of Engineers down there and, and talked about some different ideas and, and the local Corps staff down there in Rep City has um, 
came up with this location. It's a cove just right to the to the east of Patterson Harbor, where it looks like if we, with a little excavation and dirt work in that cove, and we could probably put a boat ramp and a new parking area in there. Uh, so can, uh, currently we've uh, contracted with an en engineering firm out of uh, Lincoln and and they're uh, doing some of the preliminary survey work and design work to see how feasible this new location is going to be for a boat ramp. Um, whether or not it gets built in the next few years is obviously going to depend on funding, but uh, it would be a very nice amenity to have down here to get more people into the reservoir, especially when the wind blows out of the south. It can be really tough access in the lake from the north side of the reservoir. So hopefully we can get this done in the next few years also. Okay, you can move on. And the final boat ramp projects we've had in our district are a couple of small interstate lakes just by Kearney, Key West, and Bufflehead. We've had, we had some severe flooding in Kearney back in 2019, and both these areas were devastated by the flood. And it took a while to work through some of the FEMA um federal funding but we've got that done and so now both areas have new and improved parking lots and and new concrete ramps and are open for the public again so popular little areas around Kearney you can go ahead fish cleaning stations they're one of the most important amenities for successful anglers out that we have in on our big reservoirs you know people really people really like using these after a successful day on the water. And Fisheries Division and Parks Division have worked closely for the last couple of years to secure some funding to, to upgrade fish cleaning stations to these new Barracuda units, which are industrial, specially made just for fish cleaning. Um, they have industrial grinders in them that don't get plugged up near as easy. And they, they're real quiet and, uh, you know, they don't, not getting plugged up saves a lot of our park superintendent's time because they're not spending time on plugging them during the busy summer weekend. So in 2021, we put in one at Sherman at the Marina Bay. We put in one at the Johnson Inlet and one at the Sutherland in Inlet. We're looking uh, in 2022 of putting uh, one in at Martin Bay at McConaughey and hopefully at Cedar View pending some funding. And also at a, three of the Southwest Reservoirs, Enders, Red Willow, and Swanson. And then I hear in that there might be another one going in Thunder Bay and Sherman in the next year or so if we can secure funding for that. So once again, they're very popular amenities for our, for our anglers. You can go ahead, Tony. Let's move on to stocking some fish. You know, fish stocking fish is a very important part of our fish management in a lot of our reservoirs and even small bodies of water. Um, the Southwest District has a fish docking request this year of, of 46 over almost 47 million fish comprising 16 different species. Um, we're stocking everything from catfish to, you know, bass, northern pike, muskies, uh, but the majority of the fish we're stocking um, this year to make up that 46 million is, is going to be walleye in the in the and they'll be stocked as fry. We got big fry walleye stockings going into McConaughey, Harlan Reservoir. We're putting some into Sherman, Johnson, and uh, I think Enders is the other one we're looking at for this year for some fry stockings. So that comprises a big chunk of it, but we're also stocking almost 2.3 million walleye fingerlings. Um, and uh, you'll also notice we're stock we stock quite a few larger fish such as uh, larger channel catfish and catchable rainbow trout. You know, and I'd really like to thank our, hat, our production, hatchery production staff who works at our five facilities we have across the state. You know, these guys and gals, they do just a phenomenal job of, of raising the fish that us managers request to stock in our lake. And, you know, very seldom do they tell us that they can't produce that. They'll try to do whatever we ask them to do. And, and generally they're pretty successful at it. So. You see these folks out, you know, stocking fish on a ramp. Uh, make sure you give them a big thank you next time you see them because they do a lot of important things for fish management in Nebraska. All right, next. I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we do stocking strategies for fish in Nebraska and our district. And I'm using walleye as an example, but 
you know, this same scenario works for a lot of the different species that we stock. You know, fry are, are fish that are just newly hatched. They're four to five, six days old, and then they get stocked right away in the reservoir. You know, we stock these at a high rate because we, the mortality on them is pretty high in the reservoir, but um, also the cost of producing them is a lot less because we don't have to keep them in the hatchery near as long. But, you know, we found, especially like at Harlan Reservoir, that fry has worked the best of any of our walleye stocking strategies, so we've stuck with that. And some of our research has also shown that it's worked pretty well at Calamus and Davis Creek, and so... You know, we've been doing it at uh, Sherman and Johnson, and we're going to try it at Sherman for the first time this year, as well as stocking fingerlings there. And then McConaughey, we're going to stock a pretty large chunk of fry in that reservoir this year also. And we also stock as fry wipers a lot of times, and we'll stock sauger and saw guys fry also. Fingerlings, you know, are fish that are typically one to two inches long. Sometimes we'll get them up to three inches. Um, they spend about a six weeks in a hatch in the hatchery ponds you know growing up and you know the stocking rate on them is typically 50 to 100 per acre and listed on that slide there are some of the lakes where we're stocking walleye fingerlings this year across the state you know we also stock a lot of other species as fingerlings also and then finally with the advances in our hatchery system you know they're getting pretty good at growing fish and so we've been stocking a lot of advanced fish in recent years um, especially advanced walleye, advanced mus or muskies, uh, obviously trout, or we stock them at a larger size. But, you know, we it costs a lot more money to raise these fish. They got to stay in the hatchery a lot longer. We're feeding them some high dollar formulated foods and also a lot of minnows. And so, you know, they're pretty expensive, but we typically get better survival on them. And so we've been trying those in quite a few different places across the state. So we've had pretty good success with that. Okay, you can go ahead. And you know, uh, stocking fish is, and producing fish is pretty expensive. So, you know, we like to know that what we're stocking actually works. So in recent years, we've been, you know, been spent a lot of time studying uh, the survival or the stock contribution of walleye in our reservoirs. And we're able to mark these fish as fry or fingerlings in a chemical called oxytetracycline or OTC. And they absorb this chemical into their bony structures of their body, especially their otolith. And so then in the fall, when we're out surveying fish, we can sample these young of the year walleye or sauger or whatever we're looking at. And we can take them back to the lab and remove the rotor lift and look at it under a scope. And the marked fish will show a pretty distinct yellow ring um, as seen in that bottom picture on the slide. And it tells us that that fish was produced in the hatchery. And so, you know, we've looked at this at McConaughey and Harlan and, you know, we've, see, we've seen some years where the stock fish don't contribute as well, but there's a lot of years where they'll contribute well into the 90% of the fish that, that we sample in the fall. So um, this year we're gonna be looking pretty close at the walleye we stock at Lake McConaughey and at Sherman to see um, which ones are coming out of the hatchery, hatchery and which ones are naturally reproduced. So you can move on. As Tony mentioned earlier, uh, trout stockings are going on, so I won't spend much time on that. We've got about a a dozen lakes that we're stocking with trout. Um, some of them have already been stocked already this week, and uh, it's always a popular program for people. Uh, in addition to these lakes I have listed, we've also got some trout going into Ogallala here over the next month, and then also in a small stream down at Elm, at Elm Creek WMA, which is down east of Red Cloud, which is a little small trout supporting stream we have down there. So yeah, you can go ahead. And finally, you know, if you're interested in what we're stocking for fish, uh, I'd like to direct you to our website, outdoornebraska.gov. We have a database where you can search any, any of your lakes or by species and find out what's going out. You know, our hatchery folks do a really good job of updating this as soon as they stock fish. So um, if you have any questions on what's going into your lakes, feel free to or go to this site and it'll tell you everything you need to know. So move on.
I wanted to speak just a little bit about some of the road known renovations we have. We don't do a lot of them in our district, but we do um, work on some of our small water, waters each year. Um, this past year, we renovated two interstate lakes out by in the western or out by North Platte in the Cozad area. Um, both these lakes had high, con high populations of gizzard shad and, and common carp, and they just weren't living up to their potential as a sport fishery. So we, we go in with road known. And we removed uh, we removed all the fish species with with the chemical, and then uh, once the lake detoxifies, they get stocked back with sport fish. So East Sutherland has been restocked with smallmouth bass and perch, and then it's scheduled for some rock bass and some advanced saw guys this year. So it's going to be kind of a unique little fishery. Uh, West Cozad, which is just on the west edge of Cozad, was stocked with largemouth bass and bluegill. So. It takes about two to three years for these fish to get back online, but it won't be long and they'll be providing some, some really good fishing opportunities. Okay, you can move on. Fisheries research. We have a, a lot of fisheries research going on in the Southwest District. Um, we've had a really good relationship with the University of Nebraska at Kearney over the last 15 years, and they have a an up and coming really good fisheries program right now. Um, in our office here in Kearney, we have uh, Dr. Keith Copel is in charge of research um, for the game of parks for this part of the state. And he works a lot and works really closely with uh, Dr. Melissa Woolner from the University of Nebraska at Kearney. And between the two of them, they coordinate um, four to five grad students each year um, on various projects throughout the district. and. Uh, over the past year, few years, we've done a lot of work in Harlan, doing research, evaluating um, fish, com uh, fish uh, community response to some of the coves and, the, and uh, how fish use those habitats in the coves and how they react to the adjusting water levels when water levels drop and they get stranded in those coves. And right now we currently have a grad student who's working, he's working on some of the vertical distribution of the habitat in the lake as it as the, as the reservoir fluctuates. And these, you know, provide us some good data to use that we can use it to analyze how effective our aquatic habitat projects are down there. And, and they give us an idea of what we can do to maybe make some of our future projects better for fish. In addition to that, we've got uh, another grad student who's working on the, uh, how fish react to Georgia cubes when we put them in the lake. Uh, Georgia cubes are, a PVC plastic structure that uh, we've been putting in quite a few reservoirs and small lakes around the around the state. I'll talk about here in a minute. And uh, he's evaluating how fish and fish populations respond to these and and how vulnerable they are to anglers and that type of thing. Okay, you can move forward. Lake McConaughey has been a big. Uh, it's been a location with a lot of, we've really increased our uh, research presence on that reservoir since 2015. I think we've had about six different graduate students who have done big projects out there since then. You know, some of our first projects we did out there looked at, uh, you know, um, fish communities and population dynamics and where we looked at all species just to, to gather age growth information and size distribution and that type of thing. Um, some of our future data or some of our current data right now, we've been looking at uh, the stock contribution of the walleye in there using the OTC marking, like I mentioned earlier. We've had uh, done quite a bit of work working with uh, white bass and uh, trying to determine where they spawn in the reservoir and how we can increase their densities out there. Um, we have uh, this colorful little map you see here was created by one of the grad students to determine some of the high density areas on the lake where predators are present, such as small smallmouth bass and white bass. Um, so it would give us a better idea where we could, could stock our walleye fingerlings and white bass fingerlings to avoid predation from these fish. So um, what we're doing is we're trying to get a better survival rate of our stock fish by using some of this data. And then we got currently got a grad student out there right now who's working with some some data and doing some modeling to see what um, potential regulation changes would have, what impacts they would have on the fisheries. So we're getting a lot of getting a lot of research done in this part of the state, and uh, 
Um, it should provide for better fishing in the future for everybody. So move ahead. Yeah, I mentioned Georgia cubes. Uh, here's a picture of what a Georgia cube looks like. They've, they've kind of been a big thing down in Kansas for quite a few years. And so we've kind of adopted them up here and started using them in quite a few of our lakes. We uh, received a pretty sizable uh, grant from the Bureau of Reclamation a couple of years ago to, to uh, purchase the materials and build these and place them in Bureau owned reservoirs. So um, the four Southwest reservoirs down there are getting some of these made right now and they'll get deployed here this summer as soon as they get constructed. In addition, I think we've put some at Merritt and Davis Creek and some of those other Bureau lakes. And then the, the, the core engineer staff down at Harlan Reservoir has been really proactive in building these the last several years. And they have a group of volunteers down there that have built several hundred of them down there. And they've placed them in three or four different locations on the reservoir. And, and you're starting to hear some pretty good fishing stories from people catching, catching fish off of them now through the ice and the open water. So they do provide some pretty beneficial um, fish attracting abilities for, for anglers. In addition, we've constructed some of these and placed a few in some interstate lakes, as well as some cedar tree brushing projects in several interstate lakes, especially out by, out by North Platte. So, okay, you can go ahead. I'm going to kind of shift over here and talk about water levels now and what we're predicted to see in some of our reservoirs this year. You know, a lot of our reservoirs fluctuate a lot every year, um, and some of them don't have a dedicated water source, so there's no guarantee they're going to fill. You know, we're real fortunate. Sherman Reservoir, we see it fill every year. Uh, Johnson Reservoir and a lot of those on the Platte Valley system are pretty stable, and we don't see a lot of fluctuation in them. But um, a lot of them, a lot of the large ones uh, do fluctuate quite a bit, and some years are they're low, and some years they're not. And you can see by this picture of the uh, Gremlin Cove down at Harlan Reservoir. You can see the difference in uh, that six years makes in a reservoir going from real low to way up into the flood pool. So uh, currently Harlan Reservoir is only down about a foot and a half or so and, and it's expected to fill here in the next month or so. And so we'll be going into the, you know, the, the spring season with a full reservoir down there. So hopefully we'll start getting some rain here soon and we won't see a big draw down there this summer, but uh, things look pretty good down there for right now. You can go ahead. The Southwest reservoirs on the other hand, don't look quite as good. Um, you know, Medicine Creek is kind of an exception. The creek that feeds it has a pretty stable water supply. And so currently right now it's, it's almost full. It's only down about a half foot and should be full here in the next few weeks. The other few reservoirs, on the other hand, um, are down quite a ways with Enders being down the furthest. Uh, it's down about 30, 31 feet. It only has about 19% of its capacity. And Red Willow and, Sh and Swanson, they're both just, you know, just slightly under half full. So you know, unfortunately, we're not seeing a lot of gains and elevations down there over the years. And um, so they're just kind of holding on right now. And, you know, hopefully we can get some more precip precipitation to help fill them up this year and not have real dry summer. Otherwise, we might see them drop even farther. So we can move on. McConaughey, that's uh, that lake. It, Reservoir has been around for 80 years, and we've seen a lot of different uh, elevation levels in there over the over the its lifespan. Um, currently, it's about 22 feet down um, from full pool. Um, from talking to Central's engineers the other day on the phone, they think maybe it's going to come up another couple feet maximum before it starts to drop again uh, when they start releasing for irrigation. So we're looking. Looking at starting the season that we're having a high elevation this year of about 20 feet below full pool. Um, last year we saw about a 16 foot drawdown in average years. I think the average drawdown is about 14 feet. So 
you know, unfortunately, the snowpack in the mountains is below is below the 30 year average right now. So we're not expecting real good inflows coming in this year. And so um, McConaughey is going to have a lot of sandy beaches this summer for the for the tourists to use. So we can move to the next one. Elwood Reservoir uh, has a couple unique issues going on with it right now. Um, several years ago, the engineers have, they determined that there were some seepage issues along the pump station that fills the reservoir and, as well as along the main dam of it. And so the engineers that, in, that investigated that recommended they don't fill the reservoir any higher than 10 feet below full pool until they address the issues of the seepage. So, you know, the past couple of years, we haven't had a full reservoir. Right now, the lake's down about 30 feet. Um, from talking to Central's engineers, um, they plan on running water into the reservoir here in the next, starting in April. And their current plans right now are to fill the reservoir up to an elevation of 10 feet below full pool. So by, you know, middle of May, we should see a lake that's 10 feet from full pool, so. And then I would expect operations next year to be kind of similar to what they were this year. We'll probably see ourselves about 30 feet down by, by the end of the summer again. So we can go to the next one. There's also some uh, issues with their canal structure. Um, you know, although Elwood was constructed back in the late 70s. Uh, the canal, the U65 canal that comes off by Johnson that feeds Elwood and then runs into the to the irrigation district down by Bertrand and Loomis was built 80 years ago. And there's a siphon tube that goes underneath Plum Creek, you know, between Johnson and, and Elwood that's showing it's showing its age and showing some some pretty serious. Um, deterioration and it's going to need to be replaced pretty soon. So Central's been investigating this for quite a while and they've determined that it's going to be probably more economical and, and better just to create a new route of water to the reservoir. So if you can see that red line on this map, that's going to be the new proposed canal that runs from the E65 to fill Elwood Reservoir. And so the water is going to come into the northwest portion of the lake now instead of down on the eastern side. And this one's not going to require any pumps to fill it. Gravity is going to allow uh, the water just to flow into the reservoir um, without having to pump it. And then they'll end up releasing the water out of the, you know, the same place where they currently release it now and then go back down into that B65 canal. So they've, they've received a pretty good chunk of money from the Nebraska Water Sustainability Fund and and they've started the design process on this and they hope to uh, start, you know, some land acquisition and some construction on it later this year, I believe. So, or maybe next year, but it's gonna happen, it sounds like, um, which is gonna change the way Elwood operates a little bit, but. Okay, moving on to angler surveys. You can, you can go ahead, Tony. Uh, angler surveys are, a something we've been doing for quite a few years now and they provide us with a lot of good information from uh from our fisheries you know based on a you know to total harvest of fish and catch rates of fish and the amount of anglers we're having out there angler success and just a whole variety of things and you know the data we collect off that you know provides provides a lot of information for us to to make management decisions well we got a few uh questions we'd like to get answered at McConaughey this year. And so we've contracted with the University of Nebraska uh, co-op down there in Lincoln and uh, the Fish and Wildlife Research Unit. And uh, we're going to do a couple pretty major creel surveys at McConaughey this year, assuming we can get some people hired to do the job. We're really struggling to find some help. But um, we're looking at doing an April and May nighttime dam creel where we just interview people who are fishing the dam at night during those two months from sunset to sunrise. And then at the same time, we're looking to do an October, April to October trail survey on the main reservoir. And so this will allow us to, you know, gather some pretty important information and, you know, hopefully will help us make some educated decisions in the future um, on how we want to manage 
the, the different types of fisheries out there. The other big creel survey we have going on this year in the districts at Sutherland Reservoir. This one, you know, is a kind of a biennial creel that happens out there in conjunction with NPPD and the co-op. And so you'll probably, if anybody fishes that reservoir, you'll probably run into an angler survey clerk out there also this summer. So that's going to run from April to October also. So if you if you have a one of our survey clerks contact you, take talk, take the time you know to talk to them a little bit and answer their questions because the information you provide is extremely important for how we how we make our management decisions on these water bodies. All right, you can go ahead. I just wanted to talk just briefly about fish population surveys. I'm not going to go into it real in too much detail, but we do uh, we spend a lot of time. Um, doing fish population surveys using primarily electrofish and gill nets and trap nets to evaluate, you know, long-term trends of our fisheries and to evaluate our regulations and to um, evaluate our stockings and that type of thing. Um, it's how we collect the data to, to make a decision. So we use electrofishing a lot to collect largemouth bass, flathead catfish and brood stock and that type of thing. Uh, gill nets are our primary method we use for collecting open water species in our in our reservoirs, such as walleye and white bass, species such as channel catfish and gizzard shad. And then we use the trap nets to capture shoreline species such as bluegill crappie and that type of thing. And you know why we we use this data for a lot of our management decisions, but we found that uh, you know anglers like to use this data also. So. You can go ahead, Tony. Um, so we've we've made this data available to anglers now, and we all send our information into to Lincoln, and we they publish a, we publish a annual fishing forecast every year, which shows you know all the reservoirs we've sampled for different species of fish, and you know which ones have the the most fish, and which ones have the best fish, biggest fish, et cetera. So. It's become a piece of a pretty popular piece of information for anglers out there, and you can find this document on our website at Outdoor Nebraska, or it's it's in our district offices or wherever else permits are sold. So I'd encourage you to pick one up. It has some pretty good information in it. Okay, you can go ahead. I'm going to go through just a few species um, of what we see. Um, this is a statewide walleye graph. Um, as you can see, you know, the Southwest District has a, quite a few of the walleye fisheries in it. You know, we break down the, the net catch by the number of fish we catch per net, and then we break it down by size groups. And so you can take a look at this graph and you can look and say, hey, that, you know, a lake like Sutherland or Maloney has high density of fish, and most of them are, you know, less than 20 inches long. And so that'd be a good lake to go to maybe if I wanted to try to catch, uh, you know, a limit of, a limit of eater size walleyes. If you're into bigger fish, you know, you can look and say lakes like, uh, you know, Merritt, McConaughey, Elwood, Sherman, they got some pretty nice blue bars on top that show they have some quite a few fish over 20 and 25 inches. So you might want to go to the target those, you know. And then we also see, we do see, you know, some lakes and I'll Merritt and McConaughey are both pretty good examples of that where, you know, you can go there and expect to, to find both small fish and big fish in most years. It's um, they're both pretty phenomenal fisheries right now. So you can go ahead, Tony. <clears throat> if you look at this graph here, this is just our walleye for the for the district. And you can see Sutherland kind of top the list last fall in our district, but uh, most of the fish there were, um, you know, fish that were under 20 inches in size. You know, Maloney's real similar to that. We saw the same thing in Harlem last year. We saw a lot of smaller fish and just not a lot of fish over, over 20 inches. Um, if you wanted to catch those bigger fish, like I say, McConaughey, Elwood, Enders, and Sherman all had some pretty good bars of bigger trophy size walleye coming out of those lakes. So. Just to give you an idea of what we have, you know, things don't change a whole lot on a on an annual basis in our district. It stays fairly constant. So we can move ahead. I included this because uh, you know we've been stocking sauger in our canal system since I think 1998 was the first year we introduced them in there. 
Um, Sauger aren't native to central Nebraska. They're native to the Missouri River, but they were never really ever found down here. But, you know, we started stocking them in that tri-county canal system in the reservoirs uh, in the Midway, Gallagher, and Plum Creek. And they've found those turbid reservoirs to their liking, and they've done really well. Um, and they move down the system. We see quite a few of them in Johnson Lake now also, but we've established a pretty good population of them in the canal. And, you know, in fact, we our hatchery uses those sauger to um, create uh, as, as brood fish to create more fish every year. So we had crews out on the canal today and we, we gill netted quite a few sauger below a couple of the checks to provide some fish to the hatchery today. So they're up there staging and, and uh, ready to be caught by anglers. And saw guys are another fish that we've been stocking in our district recently. They're obviously a cross between a sauger and a walleye. And we found that they're doing pretty good in a couple of the Southwest reservoirs, Red Willow and Medicine Creek. So we'll, we'll keep exploring that option of stocking those down there in the next few years. So we'll move on. Uh, wipers. The Southwest District pretty much rules the world for wipers in Nebraska. We have pretty much most of the wiper fisheries, with the exception of of just a few others in the in the uh, state. But uh, Swanson this last year um, led all the lakes with um, pretty good numbers of fish. Lots of them under twenty inches. If you're looking at bigger wipers, um, I'd recommend Elwood, McConaughey, Harlan. Um, Red Willow, Swanson, they all have typically produced pretty nice fish over 20 inches in the past. So um, these fish are, we, we stock um, in some lakes annually, in some lakes, oh, biannually, and in some lakes we only put them in every third year or so. So basically they're, we stock them as, and manage them as a trophy fish in most cases and allow them to consume the excess alewife and gizzard shad in our reservoirs. So. Good move on. And as with as with wipers, our next lake or white bass, uh, our district has a lot of white bass fisheries in it. Also, um, this last year, Harlan was just off the charts for white bass, um, as it was in 2020. Also, so anglers should really expect some pretty good white bass fishing down at Harlan over the next few years. At you know that high water we had in 2019 really helped them get a couple good year classes off down there, I think. But you can look, see most of our other reservoirs have pretty good populations of white bass in them also. So we can move on. Then I threw in crappie. We do have some, a couple pretty decent crappie reservoirs in South Central Nebraska. Uh, Johnson last year was had a lot of fish in it. Uh, most of them were pretty small, but uh, under under 10, under eight inches, but there's a pretty good number of them in there that are coming up through the system. You know, typically Sherman Reservoir is our best crappie reservoir in the Southwest District. Uh, consistently year in, year out, it produces pretty good crappie numbers, as does most of the, the canal lakes, such as Gallagher and Plum Creek and Midway. They're pretty good crappie lakes also. So we can move on. And I kind of went through those fast, but if, if any of you are interested in more uh, detail on, on individual reservoirs, I'd, I'd really encourage you to go to our website. Um, all the biologists, not only in Southwest District, but across the state, put together some pretty detailed sampling reports each year on what they find in most, most of their major water bodies. And so you can go online and, and uh, get some detailed information for, for most water bodies. Um, that can help you out and answer some of your questions. And if you don't find what you need in those, I'd also encourage you to just get a hold of your local biologist and give us a call, shoot us an email, whatever, um, and ask us if you got any questions, because that's what we're here for. That's what we get paid the big bucks for, is to, to answer some of the questions that you guys might have. And I guarantee you, you're going to get more accurate information out of us than you are from talking to your buddies on the internet or or in the bar. So feel free to you know, get a hold of us whenever you have a question. So next one.
And the final topic of the night is in aquatic invasive species. You know, it's um, something that we wish we wouldn't have to deal with in our state, but unfortunately we do. Um, we, um, you know, things like the zebra mussel and the silver and the Asian and the big head carp, they, they seem to get a lot of publicity in the newspaper and on TV. And, and there are two pretty major threats we have, but, um, Invasive species can be a lot of other different things. You know, we see some crayfish that are that are invasive. We see a lot of plants that are invasive anymore. Um, lots of other fish species are invasive. Um, you know, even things like a zooplankton can be invasive if, um, in the wrong spot. So um, we've been pretty fortunate so far in Southwest. We haven't documented the zebra mussels yet. Um, and hopefully that won't we won't see them in the near future or forever but we do have uh, silver carp and big head carp that have moved up the platte river system all the way to the lexington area and up the loop river you know up into the saint paul area so be aware of them um, we also are starting to we're starting to find a lot more invasive plants in our reservoirs uh, such as eurasian milfoil and curly leaf pond wheat so um, you can move on to the next one. This next map we're going to show, it shows the distribution of zebra mussels and, and quagga mussels across the United States. And um, in Nebraska, the confirmed cases have been the Missouri River, Lewis and Clark Reservoir, and, and several impoundments around, small impoundments around Omaha. Um, but as you can see, the state of Kansas is, has a major zebra much, mussel infestation in almost all of their reservoirs. And we're also seeing them move, the, move their way up the, the main stem reservoirs in the Missouri River up in South Dakota. So, you know, if any of you people go to these other states to fish or to, to recreationally boat, you know, and, and, you, and you're boating in these waters, you know, it's your responsibility when you come back to Nebraska to have your boat clean, drained, and dried, and, and decontaminated before you put it into a, you know, one of our water bodies. You know, it's uh, it's everybody's responsibility to help to prevent the spread of these of these invasive mussels. The two yellow dots you see, or the yellow squares you see out in western Nebraska, those are actually um, cases where mussels were confirmed via eDNA, but um, they never were determined to be established. And so they, it was just a false positive rating from eDNA readings, I guess. So but just be aware that people need to be real vigilant about how they keep their equipment clean and, and so they're not transferring from lake to lake when they're moving around. Next one. Uh, recently, Game of Parks hired an aquatic... Uh, Invasive Species Program Manager, uh, Chris Starr, and he's um, kind of moved our Aquatic Invasive Species Program up a notch or two, and he started doing quite a few uh, vegetation sampling or samples this year on water bodies across the state. And, you know, lo and behold, when you start looking for something, you're more than likely probably going to find something you don't want, and he did. He found quite a few of our lakes in our state have, have uh, Eurasian water milfoil, in them, which is um, an invasive species that causes some pretty major issues with, you know, clogging up boat motors and making making it just impossible to fish and have a whole variety of things. It's pretty, it's a, it's a plant that, you know, grows in real dense mats and can take over a lake pretty quick. So now while we do have a native northern version, this Eurasian version is, is kind of a, uh, it's a big threat, and we've, we found it in Swanson Reservoir, uh, Rock Creek, and a couple of interstate lakes by North Platte. So we're currently looking at ways to try to eradicate it. But uh, if you boat these reservoirs, or any reservoir for that matter, um, make sure you clean all the vegetation off your, off your boat, trailers, and motors before you move on, because a lot of these plants can just spread from by fragmentation. So if you have just a few you know, a few stems on your boat motor and you back into a new lake, you can introduce it there. So be aware of that next time you're out too. All right, you got one more here. Go ahead. 
So, yeah, I just wanted just to talk to you about what we're doing to prevent AIS. You know, like I said, it's everybody's responsibility to be aware of things and, and to clean, drain, and dry your equipment. You know, Game of Parks is going to have if some technicians out on the ground this year working a lot of our major boat ramps to educate people and to do some boat inspections. But we can't be everywhere all the time. So um, we rely on on the users to, ed to be educated and to take part and help cleaning their equipment and, and taking care of things. Uh, we'll also have crews out where we, we sample most of our major water bodies once, twice, three times a month for, for zebra mussels and villagers. And then we're gonna be doing a lot more vegetation uh, sampling this year across the lake to, or across the state to see what we have for exotic vegetation showing up. So if you're out and about and you see something that doesn't look quite right, you know, get a hold of one of your biologists or your local district office or that email or address on the bottom. You can contact Chris Starr directly with that and let us know as soon as you as you find something because we don't always find everything when we're out and about. So we rely on the users to, to help us out. So I got one more, I think. I guess my final slide of the night, I'd like to pay respect uh, to Brad Newcomb. You know, he worked he worked for this outfit, I think 42 of his 65 years of life, and he passed away in, in April of 2021. Um, you know, he started his career with Game of Parks back in the 70s. He worked on the Missouri River doing some research out there. He uh, moved to the Lincoln office and was real real smart when it came to computers and did a lot of the first computer programs we use in this state for analyzing fish data and doing angler surveys. And then in the early 90s, he, he moved into the south central part of the state as a district fish manager. And when the districts combined in 2011, he became the district manager for the whole southwest district. But you now he was instrumental in, in doing a lot of good things for reservoirs. He took part in, in the early 90s. He he uh, was part of the team that helped that started in implementing the more restrictive walleye regulations and bag limits, which ultimately created some better fishing opportunities on a lot of our reservoirs. You know, he loved to experiment with new stocking ideas and he was instrumental in in uh, introducing sauger to the canal system. And he always made sure all the anglers down at Harlan had plenty of wipers to catch. So that's kind of a joke for the guys down at, at Harlan. But he he had uh, some pretty good wiper stockings down there that, that stuck and, and uh, created some pretty phenomenal wiper fishing for, fishing for a few years. But, you know, he was passionate about reservoirs and did everything he could to, you know, make reservoirs the best they could be for fishing. So, you know, his mark that he left in his 42 years of working for the Game of Parks is something that we we all benefit from every time we go out on the lake and fish in this part of the state. So he's a big, it's a big loss for our agency and and uh, we miss him a lot. So move on to the next one. And here's the crew that works in the Southwest Fish District. Uh, we got Daryl out there in the Ogallala office and then Jared and Sean in the North Platte office, as well as Mark Staub, who serves as a, our district technician out there. And then our newest uh, biologist we have working here in the Kearney office is Alex Engel. So all the contact information is there. Feel free to you know get a hold of us whenever you have questions regarding your, your water bodies and, and we'll be more than glad to reach out and ask you or try to answer whatever questions you might have. So with that, that's all I have. I apologize for all the technical difficulties. I hope you're able to see and hear and understand most of the things we talked about tonight. So with that, we'll try to answer some questions, I guess. Yeah, great, great job, Brad, at picking up uh, after we fumbled around there for a while. I think our I think our internet connection is a little bit better now. So hopefully this question and answer period uh, goes smoothly and uh, appreciate everybody. I mean, we still have 93 participants online. So that that's really a testament to the, the interest and passion mm -hmm. all of you have for, for these fisheries in this part of the state. So 
Um, appreciate everybody being on. And, and uh, I know there's been quite a few questions coming into the chat box. Uh, Jordan Cott is going to be doing some of the moderating, uh, kind of directing questions to each of our staff members. And we'll, uh, we'll kind of hand things to Jordan. He'll kind of direct, uh, directed a lot of the questions from here. But great job, Brad. Thanks. Thank you. Yep. Thanks. Thanks, Tony and Brad. Uh, we'll start things off uh, talking about the white bass die-offs that have occurred off and on at both Lake McConaughey and Sutherland Reservoir. Um, Tony and or Brad, if you want to talk about those. Yeah, I could probably, yeah. you want to start? I mean, I could start. I, we don't, we don't really have any real conclusive evidence on what killed them. Um, we did see a pretty big die off at, at uh, McConaughey in, I believe it was June. I, Daryl Eichner might want to respond to that one. And then I might let Jared respond to what he found at Sutherland for numbers when we on that one. Because they, they're the two management biologists that work on those areas. So, but either one of you two guys like to respond, Daryl or Jared? Well, I, I could, I guess, on Sutherland. Okay. Um, I wasn't, I wasn't in on it, on the investigation myself, but I guess, um, you know, 95% of them seen were white bass. Now there was some wiper included, um, and there was a few other species, but in very low numbers. I mean, just a few. Um, I think in both of these cases, it was the cause of the fish kills, what everybody's curious about. I think it was we think it was natural causes. Um, there was a poor water quality parameter of some sort. Uh, we don't know exactly what uh, that came through. And it was just the last, kind of the last straw for these white bass. Um, oh, I was gonna, oh, there's a number I was looking for. The total fish counted at Southern one was 1,431. And that happened. Uh, at the very first part of September. Yeah, we were able to collect a few fish and send them to the lab, but we didn't really get any conclusive results back on what killed the fish. So it's just a lot of times with fish kills, you just don't you just don't know what the exact cause was. It's just the right, you know, the right environmental stressors hit them and and they succumb to it. So it's unfortunate, but it does happen. I can make a comment on the McConaughey. We, uh, the die off, we counted around 1600. They seem to be all in one relatively similar size group, 16 inch fish, 15, 16 inch fish. Uh, like Brad said, we really don't have a reason why. Um, in the 1600 count that we made, there was probably more than that. But again, like so many times, we really don't have a reason what the culprit was. Thanks, guys. Um, I'm going to try to bring Assistant uh, or Deputy Director uh, Jim Swinson in on this next one regarding uh, the access road at Cedar View. I know you answered it in the chat, but uh, is that what's the what's the plans for that going forward? Uh, Deputy Director, are you able to jump in on that one? Yep, I sure can. Can you hear me all right? Yep. We, uh, we've identified then our rec road plan to have that work done um, with the total overlay. So that should be scheduled. We're hoping in the next year, uh, if rec road uh, funds remain intact. We did attempt to do some patchwork in there, fill some of those joint separations with uh, a local contractor, but we were unable to get any bids. So. It's a good question. It is definitely a concern we're focused on and, and uh, we will work to get it addressed. All right. Thank you much for that. Uh, this next question, I'm gonna bring in our uh, fisheries administrator, Dean Rosenthal. Uh, what's the uh, estimated cost to produce a uh, thousand advanced walleyes that are our advanced walleyes are those eight inch fish that uh, 
Brad was talking about in his uh, presentation. We calculated those costs uh, several years ago. And at that time, an eight inch walleye were about $2 and 60 to 70 cents a piece. So uh, they're fairly expensive and it's due to the high cost of feeding them, uh, keeping them in the hatchery that length of time and keeping the amount of food on them that they need to have to grow. Thank you, Dean. Um, next one is for uh, Tony and uh, Brad, you might want to chime in on this as well, talking possibly about specific fisheries, but uh, kind of the philosophy of stocking trout that may not last a while compared to some other species that uh, may be more, possibly more sustainable in that those fisheries, kind of the philosophy uh, behind that. Yeah, we, we find it very important for these, uh, to stock these catchable sized trout in, into waters in, on a seasonal basis. You know, we're stocking them now in the, in the springtime, March time period where uh, we'll, we'll have cool temperatures through probably May for those fish to hang on. Um, and then in the fall, we'll stock fish into, into a lot of different water bodies and they'll maintain through the, through the winter months. Um, Studies have shown, um, and some of our evaluations have shown that a uh, high percentage of those fish are utilized. So it, it's one of those things where these fish are put into these water bodies as put and take fisheries, and uh, they're put in there to be utilized by the angler, and a vast majority of them are. So we, we find it as a great benefit uh, for a lot of different programs. Like I said, getting getting kids out fishing, getting new folks out fishing, uh, to be able to enjoy the outdoors and kind of pass that along. And, um, you know, we have started some other types of uh, put and take or put grow and take type fisheries in some of our urban water bodies. We've been stocking quite a few bluegill green sunfish hybrids. It's kind of another type of stocking that creates an instant fishery for for folks that are going out and looking for catchable fish. Those are a little bit more sustainable warm water fishery or warm water fish that can sustain throughout. So we're looking at other avenues to uh, stock some of these catchable fish in, into our water bodies for, for sustaining those fisheries too. Thank you, Tony. Uh, Daryl Eichner, a few years ago, uh, some McConaughey strain rainbows were stocked uh, up above McConaughey. Uh, can you just talk about that project and uh, kind of where things stand with that? Actually, Al Hansen or uh, Joe Rydell at our Alliance office would be better suited if they're on here tonight uh, to talk about that. I can offer that the summer year-long environment in McConaughey is not ideal, especially when we get into these lower lake levels. Uh, July, August, we lose a good share of that thermocline, uh, the cooler trout supporting water that they need. It's a tough environment out there uh, with these lower lake levels for them to uh, survive the summer. We still see a few every year, uh, but uh, not the numbers of what it used to be in late 60s going into the 70s. Yeah, I can comment on it. Yeah, there's been a project for the last oh, six, seven years by private individuals that we've allowed to go to Innocent uh, Hatchery in Montana and get the original strain of uh, McConaughey and put eggs in, into the streams or actually they do hatching boxes they started with and then they're doing a, a side uh, little hatchery um, trays and stuff. Anyway, they've been successful in raising them, but there's a lot of things that have changed that we've kind of commented on on this. This isn't really one of our projects because we, we tried this a long time ago and it was unsuccessful. McConaughey has made tremendous changes in the last 20 years and it's called alewife and the zooplankton in McConaughey is non-existent and that is what these trout have to grow on to get to a certain size to become passivorous and uh, we haven't seen any success in any return run on these fish, and they should come back in their third year. So we should have seen 
oh, at least two full runs of fish back if this was working and we're not seeing it. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. There's more things involved there too, like a trophy walleye fishery down there that, you know, is um, going to probably eat anything that's uh, four to six inches in size too. And like Daryl commented on, we didn't have trout supporting water back there, if you remember, about seven, eight years ago either. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Al Hansen is our district supervisor out in the Northwest District. Um, Brad and or uh, you can defer to one of your biologists. How are the uh, paddlefish doing in the uh, Tri-County Canal? Well, we don't have a real good handle on how they're doing. You know, there's some big fish out there. Uh, we get reports from anglers who snag them in the in the Johnson Inlet occasionally when they're fishing or boaters will see them, you know, up near the surface of the water. Uh, we've tried to sample them a couple different times and haven't had real good success doing that. You know, there's a pretty limited number of fish in there. I think the whole stocking for four years was only about 14,000 fish. And uh, some of them are pretty good size now. We're seeing some that are probably pushing, you know, 40 inches eye to fork, but uh, we, uh, we don't have a real good handle on how many are there or where they're at. We, we see them go down the irrigation canal. They go down the E65 irrigation canal once in a while and get stranded down there. But um, to be honest with you, we don't, have, we don't have any survey data on them and we don't really have a plan on what we're gonna do with them in the future. I think, yes, we'll probably just let them, let them die out over time. All right, thank you. Um, I guess that kind of answers the next one as far as uh, paddlefish stocking and Gallagher and if that's going to continue. Um, you yeah, we don't, that at thing. this point, we don't have any plans to continue stocking them in the system. So I think the last year we stocked them was 2018, I believe. So. And then one more follow up on that. Any discussion on salvage tags for paddlefish in the in those canal areas when there's potential dewatering? Well, this might be a good one for Mike Tome or one of the other officers to answer. But I we do we do allow for the take of one of them, I believe, with a salvage tag in the irrigation canals. Mike can maybe verify that or one of the other officers in that area. The way we have things set up right now to salvage fish out of the Tri-County Canal System or the Farwell Irrigation District Canal or the Maloney Canal, um, you have to get an approved salvage permit through either the Kearney or the North Platte District Office and then um, you have to have that permit in hand to legally collect fish out of those canals when they get dewatered. So the way I understand it, I think you're allowed one paddle fish based on that permit. Yeah, I don't recall ever seeing one of those permits. Maybe they did exist at one point in time. But yeah, they, they, you have to get those through our fisheries biologists at one of our offices, sort of like Brad described. All right, thank you guys. Uh, we got a, a few questions here about Lake McConaughey. Um, to start off, talking about walleye stocking at Lake McConaughey, kind of how that came about to where we're, we are now and moving towards the future and any changes that might occur. Uh, Daryl, Brad, Tony, and Dean, any comments that uh, any of you guys want to share? I guess I can start. Um, we typically stock fingerling in McConaughey, and that again is somewhat related to the alewife uh, that we have present. Uh, they are very efficient filter feeders. We don't have the large zooplankton we had pre alewife. Um, they, they do allow us to grow some really healthy fish, but because of the alewife, we started stocking McConaughey, and we use primarily the fingerling uh, to get them. Uh, hopefully past the uh, low numbers of zooplankton, that being an issue, hopefully we can stock them on top of a shad or alewife hatch so they have immediate forage uh, available. 
uh, the last three years we have stocked uh, with a boat. Uh, the research students, uh, the research project on McConaughey has identified some shoreline predation from smallmouth, white bass, wiper, walleye on these uh, stock walleye. That's why we've gone to uh, boat stockings, get them out away from the shoreline. Prior to the boat stockings, we would take, uh, always try to split a load, uh, and these come in multiple loads, by the way, they don't all come in one day. Uh, we either split the load, the truck load into thirds or halves, uh, half go in one place, uh, half on another access point. Tried to stay away from the uh, eastern third of uh, the reservoir. There's more alewife, or there historically used to be. But uh, rather than stock the entire load in one location, we tried to split it up a little bit each each truckload, whether it was the north side or south shoreline of McConaughey. I might add another thing. Uh, we typically stock at 50 fingerling per acre based on the 30,000 acre McConaughey at full pool, that's a million and a half fish. Uh, the request this year, again, we won't be at 30,000 acres, but uh, hopefully we'll uh, get the stocking request of a million and a half. Uh, 300,000 of those will be held uh, to a little larger size, see if we can benefit from, show some benefit from that. But that uh, million and a half fingerling ties up a few hatchery ponds. And for example, at our North Platte hatchery, uh, they hope to get 100,000 fingerling per pond. So you can understand uh, that million and a half uh, ties up a few ponds. And in addition to wiper or white bass stockings for McConaughey, uh, ties up a number of ponds. Hey. Thank you, Daryl. Um, this next question is for uh, Dean uh, regarding potential closures at Lake McConaughey, uh, specifically on the dam, uh, likely referring to fishing during the walleye spawn. Is that ever uh, a possibility? I'm not sure if it's ever a possibility or not at this time. What we're doing is with, we, we did a nighttime creel at Lake McConaughey, I believe back in 2010. At that time, the harvest there was not uh, as significant as it was in May, June time period. Uh, we are initiating the nighttime creel this year to determine you know, what the impacts are now. Uh, we know things change and we're wanting to make sure that where we are on that, it's extremely popular. Uh, our law enforcement has worked the dam area. We see uh, they worked it pretty heavy along the rocks and stuff this last year. And they did not have a lot of violations that they were able to, to write citations on. But uh, we will be monitoring it and we'll be making determinations based off the information we gather. We can't just make a determination that we assume that something is happening. We have to have the data to go along with it to make a scientific uh, decision on it. And then we'll move forward on a decision at that time. And in that same regard, Dean, uh, could you touch on why we do have some closures on other areas such as the dam at Sherman is closed during the spawn and uh, wipers are protected at the Otter Creek area at Lake McConaughey. Uh, could you just kind of touch on that as well? Yeah, uh, Sherman Reservoir, the, uh, the dam was closed there due to law enforcement uh, concerns and issues. Uh, there was a lot of illegal harvest going on at that time. Law enforcement was having a difficult time uh, dealing with it. And the closure of that dam at that time was the, the easiest way to handle that situation. Uh, it also provided us an opportunity. We were using Sherman Reservoir as one of our brood lakes, and it eliminated any conflicts then between anglers and our crews when we were netting uh, our spawners in that lake. Uh, as far as the Lonergan Creek closure for wipers, um, that again was due to a request from law enforcement. 
the concentration of wipers in Lonergan Creek uh, at that at certain times of the year are extremely high. Uh, you, as one officer put it, you can almost walk across them uh, to one side to the other. Uh, so very, very high concentration. And it's just a small area that we closed off, not just, you know, they can still fish for wipers the majority of the lake. And uh, so it had very little impact on any legal fishing. And uh, so that's, that's why that was closed off. So it's a, totally different than the walleye situation. Why can't we uh, stock uh, the crappie and perch and McConaughey and some of our uh, Southwest reservoirs like Enders and uh, them, we tried a stocking. I know Daryl tried a stocking in McConaughey. Uh, he told me it didn't take. We done it one, maybe two times and didn't go on with it and stuff. Why can't we have a fishery for panfish in that lake? You can't catch walleyes all the time. And we got no pan fishery there anymore. And we were getting that way and Anders and all of them, there's just no habitat. There's no fish, there's no nothing. And we're doing nothing to try to improve it. Can you explain that to me? Well, you, that is correct. Back uh, 2010, we had, had been at uh, a new record low in 04, the, uh, a lot of terrestrial vegetation established on the uh, exposed lake bed. And we gained 8,000 surface acres in one year. And we did stock crappie uh, 2010, 11, and 12. We did not see uh, much recruitment from them. And ironically, we saw good numbers of yellow perch that found it to their liking with that flooded uh, terrestrial vegetation. We didn't stock any perch. Uh, but uh, McConaughey is an aging reservoir. Uh, we, a, a new reservoir, you have such high productivity once it's flooded. McConaughey lost that as time went on, it aged. Uh, we gained some of that back with the low water in the mid 2000s. We had a lot of that terrestrial vegetation. Um, it somewhat resembled a new, uh, newer reservoir, but uh, the, the crappie just didn't work. Well, have we tried it in other reservoirs to, to see if this is just that reservoir? Because we, we're not seeing any stocking going into to Anders or to Swanson and uh, Red Willow and stuff. You guys are dependent on the, the population that's there to produce, and they're not producing. We we have to stock walleye every year. Why can't we just keep stocking perch and, and uh, crappie and stuff? We seem to be able to do that, but we can't do the panfish. I'm going to let one of the guys from the Southwest Reservoirs respond. I can touch on that. Um, the crappie in the Southwest, uh, we, we have started sampling those more frequently to get a better handle on those populations. Uh, we're currently looking at some different regulations possibly once we have some of that data in hand uh, to try to, to benefit the crappie populations. Red Willow, Enders, some of those places, um, we've seen a lot of successful crappie fishing in the last several years. And part of our response to some of the degrading habitat, because all of these systems that we have uh, throughout the state are aging reservoirs. So we've lost a lot of productivity, not just at McConaughey, but within the Southwest um, and other reservoirs across the state and across the country, uh, outside of just Nebraska. Uh, our response has been the Georgia Q project that we're working on. We're gonna provide some extra habitat there. Uh, we do stock yellow perch in the Southwest on a rotation uh, at Medicine Creek and Swanson when we have those available. Um, and we'll continue to monitor those populations to build those fisheries where possible. But, you know, those Southwest reservoirs and McConaughey are not the same animal. You know, we have cove habitat at most of those that we don't have available at McConaughey, as well as flooded vegetation uh, due to those summer drawdowns and refilling. Okay, thank you. You're muted, Tony.
Um, this one to go to, to Daryl Eichner and uh, Brad, you can chime in as well. Uh, has there been a, any thought of possibly stocking blue catfish into Lake McConaughey? Uh, no, we haven't. Uh, I guess we rely primarily on the channel catfish. Uh, uh, it, you, you caught me off guard with that one. Hadn't, uh, that's a question I haven't got for quite a while. And we are stocking blue cats in a couple of the southwest reservoirs and into Elwood. Um, their availability is pretty tough. We don't have them in our hatchery system. And so we have to negotiate and make some trades with some southern states to collect them or to get them. And, and so it's, it's pretty hard to get the numbers we need for, for stockings across the state where they're going in currently and by adding McConaughey to that it would probably be a pretty small number of fish that we were able to stock in in the lake if we were even going to try it so hopefully maybe we can get a better supply of them in the future because they do have potential of being a pretty good pretty good sport fish thank you guys um Going to bring uh, Deputy Director uh, Swenson back in. Uh, this has to do with uh, reopening access on the north side of McConaughey Spring Park to uh, Otter Creek. I think I saw you respond in the chat uh, regarding this, but uh, in case anybody missed that, if you want to touch on that. Sure. Yeah, good question. I appreciate everybody's input on uh, what we're doing out there with our management plan. Any decision to reopen that section of the lake, of course, is gonna depend upon um, agreement with Central Public Power Irrigation District, turn and plover surveys. And when we do open it, we would probably look at an arrangement uh, with a local concession provider to help manage that section. So no immediate plans to open it, but uh, always uh, willing to consider those things. And then um, I can maybe touch on this one as far as uh, replacing uh, docks at the ramps out there. Um, that's kind of in my wheelhouse, what I do. Uh, will you work with our parks division to try to replace docks as, as projects come up and uh, develop projects? We're currently working to replace docks at Martin Bay and Cedar View um, with those ongoing projects. Uh, as we continue to, to work around the lake, we'll continue to upgrade the dock system out there. Um, we, we can't focus just on one reservoir because there's a lot of water throughout the state, uh, but we'll, we'll continue to, to work to upgrade the, the docks throughout uh, McConaughey. Jordan, if I could jump in on that too. Absolutely. Uh, that's, that's part of a very, very large effort that we've done statewide. And Kudos to the fisheries team for the work they've done there. We've made improvements at numerous water bodies, and, and uh, we're going to continue that. Uh, we've got some good funding for that program now, thanks to the legislature, and we're going to do the best we can to continue it. Um, th thank you, uh, Deputy Director Swinson. Um, Kind of another topic here, Brad, you touched on it a little bit in your talk about uh, some of the research that's been done out at uh, Lake McConaughey and where the predators are when we're stalking uh, walleye and white bass out there. Um, and maybe uh, Keith Copel, I think you're on here as well. Um, if you guys care to expand on how we're actually putting that research to, uh, to use and, and possibly changing our, our where locations of where we're stocking fish? Yeah, I might defer that question to Sean. Uh, it's part of Sean's graduate project and he might want to toot his own horn and tell everybody how he collected that data and, and how we're utilizing it to stock fish. So part of the requirements of my graduate project is you know, we're stocking these fish into McConaughey 
And as anybody that fish McConaughey knows, you know, different parts of that reservoir can have a lot different predator fish makeup. So the, the ultimate goal of the project was to identify areas where maybe there's less of these predators there, but still have, have the available resources and habitat, you know, the available food resources and habitat for those fish to survive um, without the predators that eat them right away. Uh, a lot of the research has shown that within the first three days of a stocked fish going into a reservoir or just a small impoundment, those fish are naive. They've never been around predators before. And that's where you see your highest uh, rate of predation. So if we can get them past that first three days, we have a huge opportunity to increase the available fish in the reservoir. Uh, so we've, we've worked to identify those, create those maps that Brad included on the slides. And our hope is if we can start increasing the effectiveness of our stockings, we'll see that return um, in the number of fish that the anglers are seeing and encountering while they're fishing. Um, so that's been a, a pretty big effort thus far, and we've started to incorporate some of that into how we're stocking the fish and where we're stocking the fish uh, to try to, to see, and there's some validation that's going to be happening here, hopefully within the next few two years by UNK uh, to see if we're actually making a difference on how those fish are surviving and how uh, we're affecting that population moving forward. Uh, thanks, Sean. Um, we are kind of running uh, towards the end here on time, so we're going to get to a couple other uh, non-Lake uh, McConaughey questions. Uh, any thoughts on putting a slot limit on walleye at Sutherland and or uh, Lake Maloney? I believe those are uh, Jared's uh, sub-district. Well, that that, uh, that thought's crossed my mind over the last 12 years, once or twice. Um, but with the high um, harvest rates, that go on at those two reservoirs, it's not left <laughs> my own mind. Um, if that's something that would want to be addressed, it would have to be something um, my administration prompts. Thanks, Jared. Um, and then Sean, do you know of any uh, plans to address the water level issues uh, that are going on down at Swanson? Unfortunately, we don't have control on the water. Um, where Swanson's on the Republican River there and with the Nebraska-Kansas compact, um, that, that water's kind of spoken for already. Um, you know, perfect world, we'd, we'd plug the reservoir and we'd fill it up and we'd have a full reservoir, but we don't have that opportunity, unfortunately. So at this time, it, outlook for this coming year looks pretty, pretty bleak uh, with the dry year that we're having. And we'll hope that maybe that'll change here in the future and we'll be able to fill it back up. Um, but at this time, we don't have any control over that. Um, and there's not much that, as an agency we're going to be able to do about it, unfortunately. <clears throat> All right, thanks. Uh, thanks for that. Um, somebody did ask uh, about environmental account releases from Lake McConaughey. I was able to reach out to uh, Mark Porath, who is with the Fish and Wildlife Service and is the uh, environmental account manager. He said at uh, this time, uh, let's see, there's no not planning for early whooping crane releases this spring because of the predicted dry conditions. And they're planning to save the environmental account water for June germination suppression flows. So uh, no environmental account releases uh, for early this spring. Um, And then I guess one, possibly one last question for uh, Deputy Director Swenson uh, concerning Martin Bay with the uh, the large project that's going on there and uh, water levels that seemingly are keep going down with the dry conditions. 
um, any plans that uh, we may have to continue to allow boat access in there? Yeah, you know, we continue to look around the lake for opportunities to <clears throat> enhance access when we have those water conditions. Don't have anything immediately for Martin Bay uh, other than the big project that's underway um, there. We're hoping that that with the change in, in the approach uh, will address things. But yeah, as that bay dries up, it's it becomes more and more of a challenge for us and we'll continue to focus on it. And, We'll adjust some of our operational routines there uh, accordingly. That's that's about the best I can offer right now. All right, thank you for that. And uh, I think with that, I'm going to turn it back over to uh, Brad, Tony, and uh, Dean <clears throat> for uh, any closing remarks. Now, maybe I'll start. Uh, first of all, just yeah, thanks for putting up with the technical difficulties we had tonight. Um, hopefully you're able to understand everything. If not, uh, feel free to get a hold of me personally and I'll try to answer any more questions you might have. My contact information is on the screen. I just want to let you know, and I failed to mention it in my talk, but we will be doing an in-person uh, public meeting out at the Lake Ogallala Visitor Center on March 29th uh, to talk about some of the things we have going on out there. Uh, it's supposed to start at 7 p.m. Mountain Time. So if you have additional questions about McConaughey that were not answered tonight, uh, we'll be, li be live and in person out there in a couple weeks. So would look forward to discussing things with you about McConaughey out there. So uh, that's about all I have. Uh, feel free to contact myself or any of the other biologists here. And uh, thanks for tuning in tonight. Yeah, and I want to, this is Dean uh, Rosenthal, I wanted to take the opportunity to thank all of the people that have participated tonight, all the people that have stayed online. We've had tremendous uh, conversation here. I know we haven't been able to address all the questions, and hopefully uh, with time we'll be able to address everybody's questions. Uh, we'll be moving forward with a lot of the projects we talked about tonight. And we'll be taking a lot of these questions into consideration as we move forward on our management plans in the various lakes. And I want to especially thank our Southwest District Management staff. They got a large area to cover, a lot of territory, and they do a tremendous job out there. And I really appreciate all their efforts. Uh, really appreciate uh, Tony taking the time and going through this to begin with, and all the everybody putting up with the technical difficulties. I want to thank our commissioners uh, for being in attendance on this meeting and also Deputy Director Swenson for his assistance throughout this meeting. Uh, we really appreciate everybody's help and uh, hope everybody has a good evening. And if you want, uh, show up to the meeting at March 29th out at uh, the Lake McConaughey Visitor Center, 7 p.m. Mountain. Thank you. Hey, Dean, are you still on? Yes. There is some question uh, about the possibility of doing a Zoom option with that 329 meeting too, so we can talk about that. Okay. All right, thanks. Mm -hmm. and, and one more thing to mention, uh, this will, even though we had difficulties, this will go on our, uh, this recording of this meeting will go on our uh, YouTube channel along with all of our other district meetings. Uh, they should be posted probably by early next week. So you can check out this meeting, tell your friends about it and all the other district updates. So um, echo, all the, echo all the comments. Really, really appreciate everybody hanging with us and, uh, and the interest and passion in these fisheries. Thanks a lot. Thanks team, good job, good night.